Welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World, Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, your host, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. We'll answer questions live closer to the end of the program. So feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have a question and you would like it answered. Introducing our first guest today will be our esteemed Climate and the Arts partner, Jonathan O'Reardon. John is a former Deputy Minister of the Environment dedicated to supporting climate action and the arts while honoring his late wife, professional cellist, Gail O'Reardon. Welcome, John. Thank you, Francis. Probably should start off by saying that um, Francis and Todd, who I'll be introducing in a minute, are not actually related, but they share two things in common. They have a common surname, Littman, but more importantly, they also have a common passion for creative solutions to carbon neutrality. Todd Littman is the founder and executive director of the Victoria Transportation Policy Institute which is an independent research organization dedicated to developing innovative solutions on transportation, housing, and energy. Not only in Victoria, but also around the world. Todd's counsel and advice is sought worldwide. He's got a large and growing reputation as a policy analyst. So Todd, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this program. Wonder if I can start your presentation by asking you, what do you mean by win-win? Why are integrated solutions of transportation, housing, and energy so much more effective than individual solutions? Right, that's a great question, John. Thank you very much. You can say that fundamentally, the problems that we, many of the problems that we face are the result of reductionist planning. That is decision-making that addresses one problem at a time. So uh, reductionist planning means, for example, that you have a ministry of uh, transportation that only thinks in terms of increasing mobility and a ministry of environment that only thinks in terms of reducing uh, pollution and a ministry of health that's concerned with uh, helping create healthier communities. And each of them can implement solutions to the problems within their responsibility that acts, actually exacerbate other problems. So it's actually fairly common that, uh, say, a transportation agency will make decisions uh, that of all the ways that they can improve transportation, they're not necessarily going to choose the ones that also help achieve environmental and health goals, where the environmental agency can implement uh, environmental strategies that actually increase trans transportation problems and traffic accidents. So um, really good strategic planning looks for the solutions that provide multiple benefits or at least avoid these, these conflicting solutions. So um, in my work, I've identified a number of very good win-win solutions. So uh, we'll be able to talk about those in just a minute. Can you give us a few examples to start off with and then we'll carry on? Thanks, Todd. Sure. Well, as you'll see in my presentation, um, a really good one is to improve active transportation. Not, not many people, not many motorists want to give up driving altogether, but good surveys indicate that many people would like to drive less and rely more on walking and bicycling and public transit if we had uh, good quality options, if, if walking and bicycling conditions were good and your public transit service was excellent and it was all integrated. Um, and we have experience in many, from many communities that people really will choose those options if we invest in them. Right now, we're significantly under investing in the resource efficient modes. The vast majority of our, of our transportation dollars are invested in roads and parking facilities for cars. And if we shift some of that uh, to create more walkable and high quality transit and create communities where it's normal to get around with uh, the resource efficient modes, 
we make everybody better off. We are increasing affordability and health and um, reducing accidents and climate emissions. I'm gonna talk about win-win housing and transportation solutions. The starting point is to think in terms of sustainability. Sustainability balances economic, social, and environmental goals. A lot of people misunderstand this. They think that sustainability is just environmental sustainability. But the, the framework that I use emphasizes that a, a, a policy would not be truly sustainable if it helps the environment, but harms the economy or harms people. And so we're looking for the, the true sustainability are the strategies that help achieve all of these, all of these goals. So there are a number of reasons to, that we in, that our communities should become more efficient and diverse, our transportation systems and our housing systems. Part of that is just demographic changes, aging population and smaller families and increased urbanization and also economic. So there's increased concerns about poverty and affordability or inaffordability and changing um, uh, consumer preferences and new services and technologies like what we're doing right now. So, you know, a few years ago, if we wanted to have a, this kind of a workshop, we would all physically get together. But now we know that we can use telework, that is telecommunications as a substitute for physical travel to reduce some of our trips. And all of these are justifying shifts from automobile oriented, sprawl oriented development to more multimodal communities where it's easy to get around without a car. So let me ask you this, would our transportation system be sustainable if everybody drives electric powered cars? No, because electric cars don't reduce traffic congestion or roadway costs or parking facility costs or the cost to consumers of owning a car or uh, they don't improve mobility for non-drivers and achieve social equity objectives. They don't make us fitter or healthier. They don't reduce sprawl. And would you rather be run over by an electric car than by a gasoline powered car? It wouldn't make a difference. So electric cars are good. And this, is, this uh, matrix that I've got illustrates that. It, on the left, it identifies various planning goals, various things that most communities want to achieve, uh, including reducing congestion and facility costs and consumer costs and improving mobility for non-drivers. And electric vehicles achieve two of those. They reduce uh, uh, fossil fuel consumption and they reduce pollution emissions. But if we create communities where people drop, uh, own fewer automobiles, drive less, and rely more on walking and bicycling and public transit, we're actually achieving all of these planning objectives. And that's the planning framework that I believe we want to, we want to aspire to. There's a funny way to think of this, and that is you could ask what public policies help people be poor but happy and right now, our transportation policies are really oriented toward the more expensive modes of transportation, automobile travel, to the detriment of the more resource efficient and affordable modes, and that it, such as walking, bicycling, and public transit. So um, right now, our, our, um, our uh, local, regional, and provincial governments actually have targets to, to reduce uh, automobile travel and increased use of walking and bicycling and public transit. In fact, already in our region, um, more than a third of all travel is by the, or, or in the region, about a, a, a third of all travel. And in Victoria, more than a third of all travel is made by the active modes or by the uh, resource efficient modes, by walking, bicycling, and public transit. And we have targets to significantly increase that. So the question is, how do we achieve that? Um, one way to think of this is we, we need to revalue multimodalism. We need to create a transportation system where people can and are encouraged to use the most efficient mode for each trip so that 
That means walking and bicycling for local errands and using high quality public transit when you're traveling on the busy travel corridors. And automobile travel only when it's the truly most efficient option for a particular trip. The problem that we have is that many pe most people make many trips where they could use a resource efficient mode, but they lack the incentive. And that's really the key. That's what's missing in, our, in most of our current planning is um, making sure that, that people are rewarded for using the resource efficient modes. Uh, we do know from, from uh, uh, studies from cities around the world that when we create the right, um, um, when, we, when we create the right mix of urban planning and incentives, you see people drive significantly less and produce far lower emissions. Uh, there's good research from all over the world. Um, the specific strategies that we recommend, uh, the, the organization Cities for Everyone, our local organization that advocates for efficient and uh, afford, affordable and inclusive transportation and housing, identifies six specific policies for creating more efficient transportation and eight specific policies for increasing affordable housing in the walkable urban neighborhoods, the neighborhoods where people drive less and rely more on the resource efficient modes. I don't have time to go into them, but I'll show you, for example, um, we can use walk score, which is an indicator of the quality of walking in a neighborhood. And you can identify the neighborhoods where we want to encourage people to live. Currently, our zoning codes, for example, here in Victoria, make it very difficult to build affordable housing in the walkable urban neighborhoods. If you look at this map, yellow indicates the neighborhoods that only allow low density single family housing, which tends to be the most expensive type of housing. It's very land intensive. So one of the strategies for making uh, more resource efficient, low carbon emission uh, communities is to make sure that anybody who wants to live in a walkable urban neighborhood, including families with low incomes, can find the housing that they need, the townhouses and apartments that they need in the walkable urban neighborhoods. Um, we call this the missing middle housing. Right now, our neighborhoods, those neighborhoods are not building the, uh, the, the supply of housing that's needed to accommodate our growth. And that's what this map shows. Since this, uh, um, uh, this series is about art, I also want to mention that there are, there are features that make an artistically active community. What are the features? Well, it's got to be attractive and interesting and engaging and interactive and human and meaningful and social and stimulating. And frankly, an automobile oriented city fails in terms of its artistic capability. Walking and bicycling are the key. Improving walking and bicycling and the walkability of a community are the key to making truly um, uh, vibrant, livable, and artistic communities. So if anybody wants more information, they can visit our website, Victoria Transport Policy Institute, vtpi.org, and you'll find more information on everything that I presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd, for a, a wonderful exposition of uh, how integration of housing, energy, and transportation makes for a, a less carbon intensive future, but also improves our health and our welfare and our well being. Francis and I are both uh, active electric bike cyclists, and we've, uh, in the last year, almost entirely ditched our cars to enjoy cycling around this region on electric bikes. I know not everyone necessarily can buy electric bikes, but the city has made this city, uh, the area, much more bike friendly in the last few years. And I think from what you're showing us over the next uh, 10 or 15 years, the region is going to continue to develop uh, walkable neighborhoods, uh, 15 minute access to services and more friendly uh, biking arrangements. So. Your research and your council is paying off locally, and I'm sure it's doing that uh, internationally. So thanks very much for your wisdom and advice, Todd. I'm going to pass it back to Francis now for the next uh, steps.
Yes, thank you, Todd. You have so much wisdom to share. And uh, I have to say, I remember when I first met you years ago, I always saw you around town with your bike. And uh, I have to I have to just say, John, you're absolutely right. Biking is so much fun. And on an electric bike, you can do anything. I, I can't believe what you can put in a pannier. I get all my groceries now on my bike. And I just feel like a car is frustrating. It really is once you get into it. So thank you, Todd. Our next guest shares the same last name as Jonathan's. And in this case, he is related. He is John's twin brother. He is joining us from Norfolk, England, and it's Dr. Timothy Reardon. Welcome. Dr. Reardon is a highly respected emeritus professor of environmental sciences at the University of East Anglia. Norwich and president of the Norfolk Association of Local Councils, connecting and encouraging citizens to reduce their individual carbon footprints and cut a ton by 21. So welcome and we look forward to hearing more about this cut a ton by 21 carbon reduction program you have helped spearhead and understand you have a guest joining you from the UK that will tell us more about all of this. So please go ahead. Thank you, Francis. It's lovely to see you and lovely, obviously, to see my twin brother. So it's a great joy to join you and the wonderful gang who are your audience. But, you know, what Todd was saying was really important. It, it, it is part of our lifestyle now to change the amount of carbon we use. And following Todd's line, you can live a healthy life and you can live a close-knit life and you can cut your carbon. So what we're doing in the parish councils in Norfolk, and we want to make it right across England, is to set up a mechanism, which my dear friend Joe will talk about in a second, whereby everyone feels that they can reduce their carbon footprint or their carbon use by 10% by November 2021 of this year, which is the beginning of the conference of the parties for the climate change conference in Glasgow, the so-called COP26. And we feel very strongly that if people could do this, they A, would live a happier and actually less expensive life for many, many people, but also they'd make a contribution and show the politicians that the public are leading the way, the citizens of the world can do this. Not everyone can. So we're talking about a tenth. For some people, that's less. For other people, it's more than a ton. But nevertheless, it's of that order. So Joe has set up a wonderful company called Geeky, which he'll talk about in a minute, which is a tool for helping us to know how we can reduce our carbon by changing certain patterns of behavior and then calculating all this, adding it up and showing each other, not just ourselves and our families, but the people next door and the people down the street, this is what you can do. And I can't emphasize too much that getting people next door and down the street actively involved in what you're doing gives you a lot of courage and confidence, but also makes for a community. So, Joe, over to you with your tremendous programme. Well, thank you, Tim, very much. And thank you, Francis and John, for inviting us. It's great to be here. And um, I'm, I love British Columbia. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a, a brief overview of why it's so important for what we do as individuals and why we've got to this point of, of, of Katatan in 21. So I'm going to share with you uh, my slides, which will give you some of the background on, on where we're coming from here. So as many of you know, this is the decade for action when it comes to climate change. So this shows how global carbon emissions have gone up since the Industrial Revolution, where we are today, where we need to get to by 2030, and where we need to get to net zero by 2050. Now, this clearly is a global effort, policy, business, um, every part of society is going to have to play a, a crucial role. But we as individuals have a really key role to play. And actually around three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions actually come from us as individuals, people, communities. So we have huge potential to play a really massive role in, in solving the climate crisis. Now, this graph shows that same story, but from an individual level. And this explains really why we've gone for this idea of cut a ton in 21, because at the average footprint in wealthy nations is around very approximately nine tons per person per year in, in wealthy developed nations. Footprints in wealthy nations tend to be much higher than footprints in, in, um, in nations with lower income. 
Um, so if we can help everybody cut a ton in 21 and then keep that momentum up in years to come, then actually that will get us on a very good path to get to where we need to get to on a global scale. So in terms of what that means um, individually, we actually need to get from around nine tonnes to around two and a half tonnes. This is going to look different for everybody. This is how the average footprint uh, shapes up. And as you can see, home food transport are the, often the, the biggest components. But this pie chart will look different for everybody. Now, the global targets set by, set by governments and often set by businesses are focused largely on, on decades. So often it's 2030, sometimes 2050. But we as individuals don't think in those terms. We think in terms of months and years. And actually, you know, in, in recent lockdown, it's frankly been thinking about what's going on the next day. But if we can help people think, what am I going to do this year? And as Tim said, actually, this year, it'd be great to get this achieved before COP26, then it sends a really strong message to governments, to businesses, to the world that, that people can do this. So how can we do it? Now, Geeky Zero is designed, and I'm now just sharing with you um, the tool, and it's a, it's a website that you can also use on, on your phone. So when you first sign up, we ask a few very simple questions to enable us to give you an estimate of your personal carbon footprint. Um, and this, what, this, this um, what we call the sausage chart, will show you where you are compared to the UK average, which is around the, the global average as well. Sorry, the uh, global wealthy nations average. This is the nine tons. Global average across the whole world is around five tons per person per year. And then that all important target of where we need to get to by 2030. And then you can also see how that breaks down. And this will look different for us all. But as you can see, this person here has, has quite a big transport impact. So those initial questions just give a very rough estimate. Um, but if you want to dig into much more detail and get much more granular, you can then go in and put in your own um, specific information really across all the areas of our lifestyle that we have direct control over. So, for example, if we take diet, let's say this person is going to try going, uh, let's say, vegetarian. And that will then show how that that impacts their their personal footprint. And then the next key part is what am I actually going to do about it? So within the steps page, you can choose here from over 130 different steps and you can filter them in terms of part area of your lifestyle. So let's try transport, um, how easy or difficult they are and then impact on the planet. Let's go for the try, try the local bike share scheme. I'm not sure whether you guys have them in Canada. I'm sure you do. But we also show... Um, what the broader benefits are. Clearly, biking is good for your health and also saves you money. And I think that that there's there's often a, a an assumption that living a more sustainable lifestyle is more costly, but actually in the whole, it is often cheaper. So around 40% of the steps in Geeky Zero actually help you save money. And it really is about finding the right steps for you. So what how how can you actually cut a ton in 21? So I've got um, a few suggestions, but in broad terms, you can either do it in small chunks by choosing lots of smaller steps, or you can go for some real big ones, which will slice that ton off immediately. And I wanted to show you a couple of them. So if we think about uh, a family with a car, for example, Let's say, you know, many families might have, you know, two cars. So let's see what happens. I've put in uh, here the Honda Civic, which my Google search told me was one of the most popular cars in Canada, um, driving 10,000 kilometers per annum. Let's see what happens if this person then decides, actually, I'm going to get rid of that car. I don't drive. And that is going to cut... Two, so two tons off this person's footprint. So 10,000 kilometers is, is above average in terms of driving here in the UK. Um, it you know, very much depends if you live in a town or, or out, out, in, out, out of town in terms of mileage, but it's amazing what those big steps can do. I also wanted to show you what installing an air source heat pump would do. So 
let's say this person is uh, living in a detached house, three to four bedrooms. So probably three, you know, three to four people living in the home. And let's see what happens if they decide to install a heat pump. So let's press here. Now, bear in mind, this would be spread across the entirety of the household. So they've saved around three tons in, on, in that size of house. So that, you know, is just under a ton each, depending on the number of people that live in their house. Now, how can you actually see how this, this um, tracks on, on, in terms of, you know, how you're doing against setting yourself your target of cut a ton in 21? So if this person here decides, OK, well, I want to actually give this step a try, Let's give that a give that a try here. And what that will do is then boost your score here, which shows how you're progressing in terms of uh, cutting your footprint and taking steps. And then as soon as you've said that you're going to try that step, cut a ton in 21, you actually then get your own little tracker, which will show you how you're doing um, and where you need to get to. Now, this tracker, it actually encourages you to cut a ton if your footprint is under is at nine tons or under. But if you're over, then we actually encourage you to cut 10 percent, as Tim said, because if, if you have a, a 40 ton footprint, then it's good to be able to slice off 10% of that to you know, help get on track to where we need to get to. So that in a nutshell is, is um, some initial ideas in terms of what you can do to cut that ton in 21. The, the really good news is it's actually not that difficult. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to think about um, changing our lifestyles in an incremental sense and finding the right steps for you. It might be that you just want to go for one big one or that you want to go for lots of smaller ones. And it really is about working out what's right for you and your lifestyle and your budget. But also don't be afraid that it's going to be costly. Some of the steps are, but a lot of them actually save money. And in the longer term, a lot of the, um, the, the, the ones that require an upfront investment um, you know, sometimes there are government grants, but also actually in the longer term, you get pretty good payback on them. So I think I'm going to just um, finish up there. But I also wanted to say that we also um, run a program with Geeky Zero where organisations come together and can track what they're doing together. And that's really fun to help build momentum and to see the carbon reductions that everybody's making together. Because actually one of the challenges I think we face as individuals is what can I do? What difference does my individual change really make? And actually by seeing what we, we're doing together and being part of something bigger, I think can be really motivating and also show that actually the role of the individual is a really important part of, of resolving the challenges that we face. And, and I think that that's that's a good one to take away that, you know, we all, we all have a role both in terms of our own behaviours, but also in terms of using our voice and encouraging others to, to, to do the same and, and to think about the impacts of everything that we do from an environmental perspective. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant and applicable anywhere, right? This isn't just a UK thing. This is something that we can all apply to our lives here, right? Because this is this is open source. You can find it on the internet. That's the beauty of having everything uh, accessible to us, right, Tim? You 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 know as well as Joe does that we've got to take this on, and, and well, can't this rely on governments. This is the ultimate transferable scheme and think how uh, schools could work with this. I've seen one or two of the points in the Q&A, why can't we have this in Canada? I think this is an issue that we need to be thinking about for BC and also for Canada at large. You guys have this thing called a carbon tax, but we need to be asking people, Joe has done it so beautifully, I don't need to say any more. People can really make some savings, certainly in the first 10%, and save money in their own houses. So use the carbon tax refund money to cut your carbon. You've got it all there. The Joe has set up the mechanism for doing it. So it's a double win if you think of these things. So there we are, Francis. Let's move on to others, but we'll come back at the end. But it's a real Canadian thing as much as it's a UK thing, I tell you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tim, for all you're doing in the UK and for sharing with us today. And we will come back at question time. So thank you. Now, joining us from Vancouver are our community climate partners, Sandy Goldie and Jim Bronson, who we collaborated with 
to produce a TEDx countdown video presentation, which many of you have seen. But if you haven't, you can go to the Creatively United YouTube channel. So Sandy and Jim are the force behind BC Drawdown and have been voluntarily leading free environmental sustainability classes that train and inspire others to lead classes. And they've been doing this both in BC and Oregon. And I have to say, I had the great pleasure of taking their class, loved it. They are truly wonderful facilitators. And I highly recommend everyone sign up for their courses. They're informative, they're fun, they're engaging, they're free. And do you ever meet nice people? Because people who care about these things have big hearts. That's what I've discovered. They're some of the nicest people. So talking about nice people, welcome Sandy and Jim, and please tell us more about your next free course, which I know starts next week. So thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks so much, Francis, um, for that great introduction. And we will get to our next course um, at the end, but we wanted to start out, and this has been thrilling just to hear your previous speakers. We're saying, oh my gosh, are they ever setting everything up for everything we wanna share? Jim and I have made so many changes in our lives since we started learning about the Drawdown Solutions. Um, we've switched to a plant-based diet. We bought an electric car. We started riding bikes much more, uh, turned off our gas fireplace, um, replaced a gas stove with an induction one, and divested from banks and other investments where, where they support fossil fuel um, investments. So now, our next step is we're moving to co-housing and we'll get to that in a minute, but first, just a bit about Drawdown. Uh, we've been leading classes based on the Drawdown Solutions, um, mostly in BC, but now that they've been online for a year, they, they've had people from all over the world. So we've been helping participants figure out what solutions they're drawn to working on. And then we've been training Drawdown facilitators who are now leading their own classes in BC. So this on the screen is the latest version of the book Drawdown. It's a 2020 online book that you can actually completely download if you want, but uh, or just read it um, at drawdown.org. So thanks, Sandy. Here are some of the hundreds of research fellows who have contributed to the Drawdown content and developed about a hundred solutions that when they're scaled up, can prevent the most catastrophic consequences of global warming by the year 2050. So the science is clear. Everybody who really studies and is aware notices this. The greenhouse gas pollution in our atmosphere, mostly from burning fossil fuels, acts like a blanket trapping heat and causing disruption of natural processes. And we depend on these processes, all of us, all species on the planet. So if you look at the business as usual course going off at the top of the screen, that line, this must not happen. We need to bend the curve, bring the buildup of pollution back to zero and begin drawing down the pollution that has accumulated for over a hundred years. Okay, so drawdown is that point in time when the concentration of greenhouse gases peaks and begins to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. So how do we achieve drawdown? Well, let's first start by saying that this gray rectangle symbolizes our atmosphere. Here is where the heat trapping gases come from. The current sources of heat trapping gases include electricity, production of food, agriculture and land use, industry, transportation and buildings. So we can see the percentages for each. About 40% of the heat trapping gases we put into the atmosphere is taken out every year. This is something that nature does all by itself, what it does best. But almost 60% of the heat trapping gases are left behind, creating a thick blanket around the planet. Knowing where the heat trapping gases come from and where they go helps us identify the suite of climate solutions that we can implement and scale up to reach drawdown. 
Well, you can't really teach drawdown solutions without gradually changing your whole lifestyle towards net zero. And one big way that we are doing that now is to join an intentional co-housing community in Eugene, Oregon. That's that housing density that we heard about a few minutes ago. So here's an artist rendering of the architectural drawings for River Song co-housing community. In other words, so far, these buildings only exist in our imaginations, but we will be breaking ground next month. And underlying all of this is the mission statement, which is very similar to mission statements for co-housing communities all over the world. It says River Song co-housing is an intergenerational community of independent households committed to finding purpose and a sense of belonging through working, learning, and playing together in a neighborhood designed to make a small and beautiful footprint on the land. And see, the, these are just some of the values in the co-housing community and particularly the environmental ones, living as close to net zero as possible social justice and the good of the whole. And we, we are all realizing now how social justice and environmental sustainability are completely intertwined. And minimizing greenhouse gases from energy, housing, and transportation. So River Song chose to be an all electric community. Well, I've been living in BC for this year under COVID. I've been active on the design team. We worked with our power company, eWeb, and helped the community decide to have no fossil fuels at all, none, in addition to saving us over $50,000 by having no gas infrastructure, we will be safer, healthier, and it'll be a lot better for our planetary climate. Our construction will use green building materials, flooring options that are ethically sourced and sustainable, energy efficient appliances, and will be prepared for solar. Notice our more compact community, smaller footprint, more open space. Less than one-tenth of an acre per household means that we're efficiently using the land, leaving lots of natural regenerative space for ecology to do its work. And at Riversong, we'll be minimizing the impact of transportation. Though some members will need to have their own cars, we will we will be doing a lot of car sharing and bike sharing in the community and have electric car charging stations. There's public transit. Um, a bus stop is just a block away from the community. And there's a train that goes from Vancouver all the way down to Sacramento, California, right through Eugene, which was a big draw for us because we want to be able to see our kids and grandchildren and travel by train to get to them. And here are some people who are walking on the walking and biking path that runs right beside the property we'll be able to get to town on this path by bike in about 10 minutes. And as Francis says, with those panniers on my electric bike, we can load up on groceries. And here's a bird's eye view of the community as it should look in July of 2022. Notice the garages are behind the community. So the space inside is for seeing one another face to face for talking and working and playing together. The biggest lesson we're learning from COVID is how the health and well being of each one of us is connected to the mental and physical health of everyone else. What we need more than anything is to learn how to cooperate. I was a kindergarten teacher for many years, and when I asked my students, what is the most important thing we learn in kindergarten, boys and girls, they would all say, be nice. Co-housing is based on learning how to be respectful and kind, to listen deeply and find a path through when there are differences of opinion. In solving the climate emergency, we also need to think of the good for everyone rather than what benefits the individual most. In co-housing, we are honing the collaborative skills it takes to work together and solve problems for the benefit of all. It feels to us like the way of the future. 
And just before we leave this lovely slide, I want to point out, uh, referring to what Joe said about heat pumps, this is going to be an all-electric community, no heating by gas, heat pumps in every building. And so we'll be able to take advantage of that solar during the day, and we're going to have batteries to tide us over at night. So if you'd like to know more about drawdown and climate solutions, which I'm sure you are drawn to because Creatively United is all about being a community climate hub, I refer you to the drawdown.org website where you can see a six unit video series that has the latest science and lots of insights about how we can restore balance. And also I'd like to mention that Sandy and I are doing a class sponsored by Southern Oregon University. It starts April 12th next week. And if you'd like to register or ask questions, you can email me at jimbronsonashland at gmail.com. And this is a five session class that allows people to understand more about drawdown and actually to find solutions to get into action, just like Joe was talking about. That's the class Francis was talking about that she did with us online. Okay, so we hope you'll stay connected through the BC Drawdown website. We're so grateful to the Pachamama Alliance who first launched these classes based on the original 2017 Environmental Book of the Year titled Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. At the bottom of our BC Drawdown homepage is the vision of the Pachamama Alliance to create an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I just have to say, Francis, I love this graphic and the way it shows the whole earth as one community. Let's work together to reach drawdown. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Now, if that doesn't make me want to move to Oregon and go live with you. <laughs> You're always welcome, Francis. Yeah. Uh -huh. But last week, we talked to someone in a co-housing community right here in North Vancouver. They're all around you if you start researching. <laughs> they are. There's one in Souk, in fact, and Transition Souk. And it's, it's a beautiful community. And you're absolutely right. This is more of what we need. And it has to be our future. So you know, let's take control here and not wait for governments to do this. Do as Jim and Sandy. And let's follow our hearts and lead by example. So thank you for leading by example, just so inspiring. Mm -hmm. So now it's time for questions and we do have several. So um, it's nice that we have some time for this. We'll bounce around between our panelists and find out, um, yes, what we've got here. There's all kinds of things in the chat too, which by the way, we will save and post with the video replays. So don't worry if you can't, um, you can't, you know, copy it all in time. Don't worry. Um, someone said they think it's too expensive for many of us to do what you're doing. Is uh, Sandy and Jim, while we're on this topic, do you, do, do you think it's too expensive? I would, I've heard that the cost savings are just pay off they pay for themselves. You, you know, I, I have to be totally honest, um, co-housing, um, the houses tend to be a little more expensive than market houses in the community. Um, you are buying into the common house where there are so many common facilities. And when you make decisions, co-housing draws people who are environmentally conscious. And so they tend to make decisions like we've made already um, heat pumps, so a little more expensive in the beginning, saves money later. But many co-housing communities are really working now to get affordable units in. So keep checking on that. We're working on it ourselves. We have a whole committee working Excellent. on it. How can that's, we plan? That's exactly what we need. We need more community affordable co-housing instead yeah. of some of, yes. So this is the direction we, we, thank you for putting it in that direction. Just a quick question. Um, are you going to be growing your own food there? Because that uh, that's a huge thing to be able, and you're in Oregon, right next to a, it looks like a fertile river valley there. So what's, what are you planning to do about food? 
Well, we already have an orchard that we inherited from a farmer that planted it many years ago. It was in disrepair and as a community and also with the neighbors in the area, we've restored it. It's a filbert orchard. So we've got a hazelnuts coming. And in addition to that, we have a really nice garden area. That's one of the advantages of having all of us live fairly compactly compared to a normal neighborhood. We've got lots of open space. We, we've got area for the water to soak into the groundwater system and to have gardening. And uh, so that's a big part of what everybody is drawn to. And we've got two beekeepers and people who want chickens. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. And there's a comment here, making electric bikes more affordable would really be an important step. Um, some, like a lot of people are saying, it'd be great if they could afford this, but, you know, and public transit is not very reliable. I mean, Todd, you could weigh in on public transit, I'm sure. It, it seems that it could be far more um, efficient. And I personally would love to see an all electric uh, integrated transit network that actually works. So that would be, <laughs> if we had that and then we had car sharing, just think of all the road space we could clear up for, and the houses that we provide for cars that could be affordable housing for people. So that's just my two cents. Um, Guy, Doncy is with us. Thank you, Guy, for joining. Um, He's now turning to, we're turning to some of the geeky questions now. So Joe, maybe you want to jump on. What, um, Guy's asking, what did it cost to set up your geeky website? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'd say, I mean, we're very fortunate that after two years of searching, we found the most amazing developer. Um, who the combination of, so three of us built it really. Um, and then we were very fortunate to get um, a fantastic design agency who did all the design for us pro bono. So I would say three of us built it over a period of um, probably a year, year and a half while doing lots of other things as well. But um, but it actually, the genesis of it was a, as, as a spreadsheet that we put together in must have been like 2012 something like that 2011 to start measuring our own carbon footprint and that was uh that was when we first that was a very 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 early stages of geeky zero thanks joe and then one more question is there a geeky zero assessment for community services or business operations too no, there isn't. No, we, our focus is very much on the individual. Um, and the reason that we decided to focus on that was because we were um, kind of struck by what a big gap there was between people's desire to do the right thing when it comes to the environment, but finding it really hard to know what right actually looks like. So, um, and, the, and in terms of operational footprints for companies and, and um, organizations, that's quite a well-served market. So we thought that, you know, that's well covered. And, and finally, um, this one from Gail, how do you get geeky to seniors who do not have tech access? Seniors are a large demographic and many don't use online services. Yeah, that, that is a challenge. I mean, in all honesty, for people who don't use online services, we recommend a couple of books that we know are really good. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the great thing about working in an area where, you, you know, there's a social purpose, that collaboration is so important. And there's a couple of, there's, I can share share some names um, with yeah, you, Francis. You yeah, circulate. Throw, throw them in the chat, and we'll also okay. post them with the video. How about that? Okay. I'll do that. Yes, and I think John, you have a question for Todd. Hey, Todd, I um, was wondering whether you could follow through on the discussion we had earlier about parking policies and the ways that we can be more innovative in the way we charge parking, so that people with low incomes actually can access some of your transportation strategies. Sure. Um, you know, if you are a bird flying over a city, or I shouldn't just say city, but a, a urban community, including suburbs, uh, the, the land devoted to parking is the greatest uh, uh, portion of impervious, is often the greatest portion of impervious surface, that is pavement area. Um, it's a huge subsidy for automobile travel. For the last hundred years, we have designed our, our communities for cars. And, and the, the biggest uh, tool that we use to favor automobile travel over other modes is by requ 
requiring off-street parking at almost every building. So it's a uh, it's a it's a inefficient. It's unfair. It forces our current policies force people who don't own a car to pay for very expensive parking facilities that they don't need. Um, there's a whole movement for reforming parking policies to um, reduce the number of parking spaces that are that 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 you have in a community and to make them work harder. That is instead of one parking space at each destination, you pool the parking and, and share them. So a parking space could be used by uh, commuters that during the day and, um, and uh, uh, restaurants in the evening and uh, uh, religious institutions on the weekends. Um, and those parking spaces, uh, that reduces the number of parking space you need and frees up land for other uses. So I'll, I'll um, add a link to one of the, uh, an example of the parking policy reforms. So really that's a starting point for, uh, for more compact uh, 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 development and more efficient transportation is to get rid of the, of the, the, the current policies that, that that uh, force everybody to spend hundreds of dollars a year to subsidize generous amounts of parking. Um, Gail asks, is there a step-by-step -step guide for communities wanting to start a setup of a walkable village concept? How do you go about transitioning from sprawl to walkable? So uh, there are many very good examples. Um, my, one of my favorites is the city of Vancouver's climate emergency action plan. It's a real state-of-the-art project, and um, it 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 applies the concept of what we call the fifteen-minute community. That is, uh, it's designed so that uh, most of the common destinations that you that you that you go to shops and parks and schools and pubs and all those things are easily accessed without a car uh, by walking and bicycling. Uh, within 15 minutes. That becomes a framework for, does, for making sure that most uh, houses and, and jobs are located in those kind of neighborhoods. Um, I'll, 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 put in the, um, I'll put in the chat box some links to some of, my, some of, the, some of the, the resources that I think we can use, including uh, our local organization, Cities for Everyone, what we call our Affordable and Inclusive Neighborhood Action Plan. Thank you, Todd. And Ken makes a really interesting comment. It's so true. You know, in smaller communities, why are we still using huge transit buses that just carry a few people? We should be using smaller electric vans. I mean, that just, that's so true. And Peter Lamb asks, to what extent is strong, bold action by government necessary to meet GHG emission reduction targets rather than relying on personal actions? Yeah, I think uh, in a typical community, five to 10% of the population strongly identifies as environmentalists. They're, that's people like us. And we will significantly change our behavior based on good intentions. But I think the vast majority of people have other priorities and they'll, they'll change partly for, to achieve environmental goals, but they're much more interested. They're much more responsive to incentives like affordability and health and quality of life. So when I'm talking with environmentalists, I use, you know, um, uh, change, you know, the message can be change your behavior, but if we really want to be successful, I don't think that'll, that that's sufficient. I think we need policy reforms um, that encourage people to change that, 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 that make this change possible. And that's actually my uh, criticism of the drawdown program is that there's nothing in there that talks about, about price reforms or zoning code reforms. It's all about the outcomes, things like people relying more on electric vehicles, but it doesn't actually lay out the specifics of how we'll get there. So my, my work isn't about identifying technical solutions. It's about identifying the policies 
that reward people, that, 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 that make it attractive to lead a, a resource efficient lifestyle. And that includes things like um, making sure that there's an abundance of affordable housing in the walkable urban neighborhoods for people that are concerned about affordability and making sure that um, uh, walking and bicycling and public transit are, are attractive and that we're pricing automobile travel. So, so people who don't identify as, a, as environmentalists have that incentive. Thank you, Todd. And Jim and Sandy, did you want to quickly weigh in because we're running short on time now? Sure. I just like to say I, I totally agree about the importance of public policy. That's another way our behavior has changed. We speak up at city council meetings. We support the climate caucus uh, across Canada, you know, and all the policies that they're developing. And um, yeah, Drawdown just lays out the solutions. And then how do we get them implemented? Public policy is hugely important. And a, a good example of that is carbon pricing, which Canada really has a leading role in, and we're so glad for it. Drawdown calls that an accelerator, and we need accelerators. So thanks, Todd, for pointing out that. Yes, and thank you to um, everyone who's made some amazing comments, like smaller buses can't accommodate wheelchairs and strollers. There needs to be a mix of kneeling buses with smaller carry um, Call, call buses on routes. There's so many great solutions. And that's the whole point. There are tons of great solutions. So anything is possible. And so I want to let everyone know who put questions in the question and answer box that we will definitely answer those questions with the video replay, which will be posted next week. So don't feel like you haven't been heard or seen because there, your questions will appear next week. And I'd just love to thank you all um, and to all our panelists and our guests. But I also like to remind everyone that the deadline is looming to save Mountain Road Forest. It's a precious 49 acre forest in the heart of Saanich. And thank you to everyone who's already contributed to the Habitat Acquisition Trust fundraiser. And if you would like to see this area still be safeguarded as a park for future generations and not lost in development, please consider contributing if you haven't already. And this month, this draw will be for this beautiful art print by internationally acclaimed photographer, David Ellingson who we had on, on one of our series as um, artists as change makers. It also included is a two night stay at the lovely Oswego Hotel in the heart of Victoria. And you can receive a tax receipt too. So I'm encouraging everyone, please visit mountainroadforest.ca. This month is the deadline. And talking about forests, BCs, old growth forests are a non-renewable resource. They're considered the Amazon of North America, and they provide all of us with life-supporting benefits like clean air and carbon sequestration. Only 3% remain, and we need everyone to tell our government they are worth more protecting. So thank you to everyone who's taken the time to write or copy and paste the letter we have on our website and we sent out with our recent newsletter complete with all those email addresses and phone numbers who, who most needs to receive it. John, would you like to share the latest news and why this is so vital? Yes, Francis, because we're hearing that the Premier Hogan here in British Columbia and the Forest Minister, Katrine Conroy, are making a major announcement on forests. And so it's very important if people access this letter, clip it, put it into um, an email and send it to Hogan and to Minister Conroy and to all the other MLAs in the next day or two, so that we encourage them to take the courage to protect old growth forests across this beautiful province of ours and take it where they promised to do it in the, uh, in the election campaign of last fall. So please clip and send. Yes, and our April 21st webinar will focus on the importance and vitality of another non-renewable resource. John, do you want to just say a few words about this? Yes, Francis, we're going to be talking about the Arctic in Canada and around the northern part of this globe. It's under severe pressure from climate change. The average temperature in the Arctic is now six degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial times compared to only one degree in the rest of the province. And the changes in the Arctic are having major impacts on water, on ocean currents, on climate around the world. So we're gonna explore that. And we're gonna include uh, Louise Arnal, who is a climate scientist and an artist, 
and she's going to be showing some of the paintings that are coming up in a virtual water gallery in uh, the Canmore area. So a wonderful experience next uh, two weeks time. I hope you'll join us. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Jim and Sandy, Todd, Joe, Tim, John. Thank you all. Thanks to our wonderful audience. And we'll see you in two weeks. Bye for now. Bye.